Can people see that? Yes. Yes. All right. Well, it's, it's fun. Thank you very much for joining in the midst of uh, vacation time. So um, it's uh, nice to be here. And uh, um, I'm going to talk a bit about uh, Zhao Meng's paper on um, the law of large populations and a little bit more generally just about uh, survey sampling and selection issues and surveys and that sort of area, which uh, not, not everybody is so uh, perhaps as familiar as they might be. Um, so this is actually a work in progress and Walter's on the call. I wanted to just mention that he sort of prompted this uh, thinking. Um, he sent around a draft paper on, on, on looking at measurement error in, uh, in the COVID-19 and uh, talked quite a bit about Charlie's paper and this sort of prompted me to, to revisit a little bit. And um, I've been sort of, uh, we've been sort of chatting a bit about this over the last couple of weeks. And, and he's been quite useful, I think, in sort of seeing whether what I'm saying makes any sense. And uh, hopefully we'll end up writing a paper on this at some point. Um, so uh, the paper, um, this is the, the title. It's a 2018 paper by uh, Jali on uh, statistical paradises and paradoxes in big data. He likes uh, funny titles. Law of Large Populations, Big Data Paradox, and the 2016 US presidential elections. This appeared in the Annals of Applied Statistics. Um, it's quite well cited for a paper that's uh, a couple of years old, has 57 Google Scholar citations. He actually mentioned it a little bit when he gave his talk uh, here for the, uh, for the student conference. I don't know if anybody remembers that. It was more wide ranging than that, but he did talk a bit about this at the time. Um, and the topic is sort of generally talking about bias variance, sort of trade-offs um, in sample selection from a population. Um, he also uh, earlier had a, had a nice discussion of um, the paper by Kiding and Lewis on, on, on perils and potentials of self-selected entry into epidemiological studies and surveys. This is a very good uh, RSS red paper that I recommend people to read. It's uh, that's a lot of very interesting material and important material in my view. And uh, Charlie has very nice discussion, I, I think, of that paper. Um, so uh, I'm gonna talk about random sampling and, and sort of the, uh, the important, just to, the importance of, of random sampling as an assumption in statistics, I, I think is sometimes a little bit underemphasized from my perspective. And uh, I talked about this recently and I had there's a very, another very interesting paper by uh, Andres Buhar and, and colleagues in 2019 Statistical Science called uh, Models as Approximations and the Consequences Illustrated with Linear Regression. So what can you make of doing statistics in a regression model when the regression model really doesn't hold in the population that it, it's sort of, um, it's misspecified at some, to some degree. Of course, all models are misspecified to some degree. So this is kind of an important topic and in my, in my discussion, I, I said this, uh, it's, it seems a bit, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, brash to, to quote your own discussions, but anyway, I'll do it anyway. So, um, so he, they state a key random sampling assumption in, in the paper. In fact, um, what they're doing may rely on no more than the assumption that the rows, the yi, xi, this is a regression of y and xi, uh, of the data matrix are IID samples from a joint multivariate distribution subject to some technical conditions. So IID samples from some distribution. And of course, we make this kind of assumption in, in nearly all of statistics when we're writing down any kind of a model, really. Um, so uh, this assumption, which is routine in much of mathematical statistics, is both crucial, to my mind, in some sense, it, 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 it trumps all the other assumptions we make in a statistical model. And not only that, but it's often always often very questionable. If, as usual, units are not selected by simple random sampling from a population, this is an assumption. And if violated, then estimates under the model trusting or model robust, this, this paper is basically focusing on whether you can talk about a model robust inference without necessarily assuming the model is true, are subject to unknown biases. Units are rarely selected by random sampling from a population. As with found data, not subject to a statistical design, 
for data collection or clinical trials where participants are volunteers, not randomly selected from the target population for a drug. Just, uh, we have to say something about COVID-19 here, right? So, um, Kiting and Lewis in that paper that I mentioned argue for the importance of probability sampling in, in epidemiological models. And uh, it's worth noting, I think, that as far as I know, there are no estimates of prevalence of COVID-19 in the US that's based on a scientific a probability sample. Um, the applications of the models, including from our, our great uh, colleagues in this department, um, make the questionable assumption that reported prevalences are unbiased for true pre prevalences in the population. But uh, reported prevalences are vulnerable to selection bias. Um, testing is not being carried out on a random sample of the target population. This particular assumption of random sampling is often buried to my mind relative to other assumptions like homogeneous transmission and uh, the assumptions of the SIR model, mission terror, and so on. By the way, Michigan proposed a national probability sample to, to get a prevalence of COVID-19, but unfortunately, actually really essentially designed by a, 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 um, a uh, alumnus, alumni, uh, alum, alumni sorry, of us, uh, Steve Hearing of our department, but unfortunately didn't get funded. <coughs> so anyway, I think it's important. Uh, and the broad question of the, of the main paper is, What's the trade-off between probability sampling, which is scientific, but hard, increasingly hard and, and expensive, and big data that's not probability sampled, large sample, but high potential for selection bias. And uh, um, so, yeah. So just, just as background, um, first let me talk a little bit about uh, probability sampling and uh, properties of a good sampling scheme. So if we're trying to get a good sample from a population, we'd like it to be representative of the population in some way, which is a topic, you could Google representative, it's kind of an interesting uh, uh, topic in its own right. It's not very easy to define, to actually nail down exactly what's meant by representative of the population. Um, there's some papers by uh, um, Bill Kruskal and Wallace in the 1960s to talk about this actually. Um, Dem demonstrably, free of, demonstrably free of selection bias, efficient, lowest cost for a given level of precision, and then measurable precision, so we can quantify how close the sample mean is to the population mean it's estimating, or whatever our, our quantity we're estimating. Only, I would say, probability or random sampling design have these properties. Uh, and, and probability sampling is characterized by two properties, basically. Every sample has a known, but possibly zero probability of selection. And every element or unit in the population has a known and positive probability of selection. So nobody is excluded. Uh, Zhao Li's paper mainly focuses on simple random sampling. Well, he does focus on simple random sampling, but although the, clearly the ideas would apply more generally to more complex designs. Then there's non-probability samples, which is sort of everything else which is a little bit hard to define really, but that you, so you can define it in terms of the sort of examples of non-probability samples like convenience sampling, quota sampling, open access internet surveys, optim internet surveys, snowball sampling, found data, dot, dot, dot. So there are lots of ways you can get at non-probability samples. Uh, another digression um, in my course on history of statistics, I force our students to go through this very uh, famous but quite tricky paper by, uh, by Neyman um, that a survey samplers talk about a lot, um, that uh, his 1934 paper um, in, the, in the Royal Society um, on two rep different aspects of the representative method, method of stratified sampling and the method of purposive selection. Um, I love the the header of this paper, although it's uh, probably shouldn't talk about this these days in terms where we're all very racist, but it's read before the Royal Statistical Society, the present by the Right Honorable Lord Messon of Agra and Donatar, K-C-S-I-L-L-D, in the chair. Right. A pompous English person, no doubt. Like the speaker. Anyway, 
This uh, paper really talks about probability sampling and contrasts it with something he calls, Neyman calls purposive sampling. Initially, probability of sampling was really equated with simple random sampling. In fact, some people still tend to do that uh, loosely. Uh, simple random sampling means that every sample of a particular size n has an equal chance of being selected. Hence, it's an equal probability of selection method. And samples of size other than n have no chance of being selected. And there's with or without placement, but in practice, everybody does with, without replacement. So Neyman contrasts this with purposive sampling or non-probability sampling. As I said, it's hard to define, um, but he's particularly interested in a form of sampling that's sort of like quota sampling, where um, you, you have a, a distributions of, of variables in, in the population, like a distributions of age and gender, and you send the interviewer out, and then they just find people until they match that distribution in the sample. So they have quotas of each of these age groups and so on, and then they just uh, sample until they have the, the right number in each of the age categories. So the, the, the sample then matches the distribution on these variables, age and gender. Um, and uh, the controversy that Neyman talks about is that un, under simple random sampling, which we as statisticians might like, the distribution of known characteristics in the sample can deviate considerably from its known distribution in the population purely by chance. That's kind of obvious. Um, this lack of representativeness in some, some senses has led some to prefer purposively picking the sample to match this population distribution rather than allowing it to, to be randomly chosen where it might deviate from the population. Neyman resolved this issue in favor of something that we now know as stratified sampling. You create strata by classifying the population according to the known characteristics, and then basically you do simple random sampling within the strata. Um, the sampling fraction in each strata, the little nj or capital nj here, um, if that's constant, then it's an equal probability sample. It retains probabilistic sex selection but then the sample matches the distribution of the strata and the population. So in some senses, you get the best of both worlds. You don't have selection bias, but you match the known characteristic. Um, another important element of the paper was the so-called name and allocation, which allows the sampling fraction within the strata to vary, um, and actually talk, shows about an optimal way of choosing the, the sampling fractions within the strata. And in stratified sampling, we often oversample particular strata because we're interested in getting reasonable estimates for the relatively rare strata like uh, African Americans, for example, in a, in a sample of, of people. As an aside, in the appendix, Neyman actually defines what he means by confidence interval. So this paper is, in a sense, famous because of the appendix. <laughs> Although within the survey sampling community, it's also famous for the ideas. So, so Neyman's paper helped to set the stage for extensions to more complicated, complex designs, cluster sampling, multi-stage sampling, greatly extending the practical feasibility and utility of the probability sampling in practice. So for example, in the COVID, in the COVID thing, if you're trying to get a, a, a sample to, to estimate prevalence of COVID in the United States, you do some kind of stratified sampling and you'd oversample particular areas, you get a big gain in efficiency um, by oversampling in places where there's, there's more likely to be people, cases. Um, and then, uh, so this was a very famous paper and it spurred work by Mahal Novis and Hansen, Cons, Cochran, our own, Leslie Kish and so on. By the way, I don't know if you noticed Leslie Kish's uh, wife died this week at the age of 100, so she was a wonderful lady. Okay, so enough of the digressions. Let's actually talk about Meng's paper now, Zhao Li's paper. So he talks about two laws. First law has nothing to do with uh, what we're talking about, but it's kind of cute. Um, he, he, he loves Euler's identity. So, uh, and he, so he actually talks about Euler's identity in the, in, in, in the, in the paper. Um, Euler's identity says that e to the i pi is equals plus one is equal to zero, or e to the i pi equals minus one. So you probably remember that if you've done any math. So Jali loves this identity because it 
brings together five key quantities in mathematics. So E, I, pi, zero, and one. So it is a wonderful formula, I have to say. But it has nothing to do with what we're talking about. Anyway, it's kind of fun. Um, but the, uh, what he's talking about is, is uh, something called the law of large populations. Um, and uh, just a little bit of a notation. So we have capital N is population size, N is the sample size. The sampling fraction is little n over capital N, which is, which you can call F. So uh, then there's a target population mean, which is G bar N with a capital N. And uh, the standard deviation of that variable um, is uh, denoted sigma G. So that's a particular sur survey variable. Then the G bar, I can't read very much. G bar part N, little n, is the sample estimate. Um, and, uh, and then there's R, which is a sample indicator, which takes the value one if you're included in the sample and zero if you're not included in the sample, so it's just a binary thing. And then he defines the correlation between R and G, um, actually in the population, so the really population quantity is rho of R G. Then uh, it's fairly simple algebra to derive an identity relating to the error, which is the deviation between G bar little n and G bar capital N, and these other quantities. And this is what I'm gonna call the law of large populations. I'm not entirely clear if he exactly thinks of this formula as being the law, but I'm gonna call that the law. Anyway, so this deviation, the error, is, is equal to rho, Rg, times a function of f, the square root of one minus f over f, times sigma g. And uh, um, so in, he then gives labels to these things, which I, I have some different disagreements with, I must say. So the error is fine. So he calls rho rg data quality. Um, I'm not totally happy with that because in the survey setting, people tend to think of data quality in terms of measurement error. Um, well, this is data quality in terms of selection bias, and uh, that's not really the way people think about data quality. Well, in, in, in this paper, Zhao Li sort of is, doesn't, doesn't consider measurement error very much, but I think it's a bit confusing to call this data quality because of the potential confusion with measurement error. Um, then the second term he calls data quantity. Well, it certainly is a function of the sample size, but it seems to me a more straightforward measure of data quantity is the sample size. Um, and then sigma g, which is a measure how heterogeneous the thing is, kind of a measure of prob problem difficulty. I think that's a reasonable term, um, perhaps unusual, but I, I don't have any objection to it. So that's the law of large populations. Notice that there are this is the important part of what I have to say here. There are three key, key quantities in this thing. There's the rho, there's uh, the f or function of f, the sampling fraction, and then there's sigma. An error is related by multiplying these together. Does anybody have any questions so far? I hope I'm being clear. Okay, so there are some things I like about Xiaoli's paper and there are things that I, I don't like about it. So I'm going to talk first about the points of agreement with, with, with his work, not so much the law, but with his work. Um, well, first thing is that, that there's no argument that this equation is right. I mean, it's, not, it's just math, so you can do it. Um, it's a good example for a qualifying exam, maybe. Or something. Anyway, sorry, I shouldn't mention the qualifying exam for students, probably. Too traumatic, too, too traumatic. Anyway, he says some comments, quotes from the paper. Probability sampling ensures a high data quality by controlling our rho of Rg at the level of n to the minus a half, capital N to the minus a half. So if, if you have a probability sample, you can show that this correlation between R and G is uh, order one over square root of N. That's not terribly surprising. This is true, I think, although a simpler statement in my view is just to say that probability sampling eliminates selection bias, which is what it does. I don't know why we have to consider rho, the strange correlation. Anyway, 
Then he also says, when combining data sources for population inferences, those relatively tiny but higher quality ones should be given far more weight than suggested by their sizes. In particular, probability samples should get more weight than other sources that are not probability. I, I totally agree with that. And then uh, the root mean squared error from a large data set subject to selection bias can be equivalent to the root mean squared error for a much smaller sa random sample. And this was a point that uh, I don't think it's the first person, not the first person who made this comment, but he, he made it quite vividly in the discussion of the Kiding and Lewis paper. Um, in particular, um, he suggests um, that the value of probability sampling um, increases with sample size and is surprisingly large, high. And this is his example from the election. I guess it's kind of uh, topical since we're just about to have an election. Um, mm. So estimates obtained from the Cooperative Congressional Election Study of the 2016 US presidential election suggested that a correlation between R and G of, of you can sort of back calculate what the, the selection bias might be because you know the final answer. And this correlation turns out to be minus 0.005 for self-reporting to report for Donald Trump. In other words, people are slightly less likely to report for Trump than, for, than they actually, uh, actually voted. Because of the law of large populations, this seemingly minuscule, minuscule data defect correlation implies that the simple random proportion of self-reporting voter preferences for pump, Trump from 1% of the, U, of, of the US eligible voters, which was the conglomeration of all the data in this example, in this election study, that is a sample size of 2,300,000, has the same mean squared error as the corresponding sample proportion from a genuine random sample size of 400, a 99.98% reduction in sample size and hence our confidence. So this, this kind of stuff uh, gets people's attention and I think it's, uh, I have no problem with it at all. Okay, so why am I talking about this paper? Well, there are, there are things, I don't particularly like the law of large populations, I might as well say, and, uh, and this is why. Um, because Zhao Li elevates this correlation between R and G to the status of being a fundamental quantity. Recall that the law of large populations involved three quantities. It involved rho, involved a function of the sampling fraction, and involved sigma. I don't think it is a fundamental quantity. So my main beef is I don't think rho is the right thing to look at. Um, just a couple of consequences which I kind of disagree with as a, uh, the, the result from this use of rho as a fundamental quantity. Um, when we lose this control, in other words, when we don't have probability sampling, the impact of capital N is no longer canceled by rho, leading to a law of large populations, that is our estimation error relative to the benchmarking rate one over root N increases the square root of N. Notice the focus here on the, on the population size, not the sample size. I think the key quantity for the bias variance trade-off is the sample size, little n, not the population size, capital N. The capital N only matters really if the selection fraction is high enough that, uh, uh, that it's substantial. So um, if you are sampling, two million out of two and a half million in the population, that would be a substantial fraction. But if you, if, whether you sample a thousand out of two and a half million or 10,000 out of two and a half million, that selection fraction is small. For, for that, that case, I don't think the population size matters at all. Um, the, the, sampling, the sampling fraction comes in because the error in the estimate is confined to the non-sample cases. So obviously it goes down if the sampling fraction is substantial. <clears throat> so this is again from Jali's paper, quote, for population inferences, a key policy proposal of the current paper is to shift from our traditional focus on assessing probabilistic uncertainty in the familiar form of standard error proportional to sigma over root n, should be a slash there, I'm afraid. 
to the practice of ascertaining systematic error in non-probabilistic big data captured by relative bias is proportional to rho times the square root of capital N. Well, there are two things that bother me about this statement. One is that the traditional focus on the standard error, sigma over root n, is not the, is not the traditional focus in my, my mind. Survey samplers look at mean squared error. They don't look at standard error, um, particularly if you're worried about selection bias. Also, notice the change in emphasis from the sample size, little n, to the population size, capital N. This goes against traditional thinking. And I, I would say that most people who read Jowley's paper who are samplers, would give, this would give them pause because this is something new. This idea that the, the population size really matters goes against the idea that it's really the sample size that matters, except when f is substantial, as I mentioned. So my contention is that aside from the case where f is, is getting close to one, the sample size, the population size does not matter. And it's the, the sample size that matters. Um, so this is again a quote, the, the law of large populations implies that once we lose control of probabilistic sample, then the driving force behind the estimation error is no longer the sample size, but rather the population size. So I said, I think this is wrong. And I think it's a false consequence of essentially looking at what happens treating the correlation rho rg as fixed. And uh, I'll tell you why that's a problem. So the correlation between r and g is not like a correlation between two sample characteristics, survey characteristics. It's not like the unit level correlation because the distribution of r, this indicator of whether you're sampled or not, depends on the sampling rate. Letting n increase, holding little n constant, the distribution of R obviously changes. It becomes much more concentrated around zero. The resulting correlation tends to zero for typical models for selection bias. So when he's talking about holding N and N, looking at what happens as N increases, holding N fixed, you can't hold R fixed because R, the distribution of R depends on N over N. So it's, it's, it's not the usual correlation. So I think it's misleading to state that estimation error relative to the benchmarking rate one over root n increases with root n because the correlation rho rg typically goes down relative to the benchmark as the sample size increases. In terms of the formula, this is the, the law of large populations written again. Um, if you fix n and you fix rho, the error increases with capital N, that's what Shelley is saying. But it's misleading to fix rho because for reasonable forms of asymptotics, the correlation rho tends to go down for fixed N as, as, as N increases. So fixing little n and increasing capital N is uh, you can't fix rho. That's because that is, because rho varies with the sample and population size, it's not a universal constant measuring selection bias. We can look at asymptotics, and I think if you look at asymptotics, and I have a couple of examples here, uh, it seems to me that you can show that the correlation actually goes to zero for reasonable asympt asymptotics. This is kind of superpopulation modeling asymptotics. You let the sample size and the population size grow, um, and then you see what happens to the uh, uh, bias and mean squared error. Um, here's, a, here's a couple of examples. So suppose you have um, the selection probability for unit i in a population is c times pi i, where c is a scale factor cho chosen so the expected sample size is little n, and pi i is essentially the probability of being selected. So pi i, if that was a constant, you have a single random sample, but because of selection, that probability might vary across the units. So you can easily show then that the bias um, between the sample estimate g bar little n and the population quantity g bar capital N, um, it does not depend on little n or little n. In fact, routine calculation 
shows that the correlation then has the formula given down here. And as the sample size, as the population size increases holding little n constant, this correlation does tend to zero. So for this very, to my mind, this is the most intuitively straightforward way of thinking about selection bias um, for individuals. You have some unknown pi sub i selection probability. The correlation actually goes to zero um, as the capital S sample size, population size increases holding n constant. Um, did I go the wrong way? Second example is, uh, is the Heckman selection model, model for selection bias. Um, well, a slightly modified version of the Heckman model <coughs> to allow for different sample sizes, basically, and the same degree of selection. Suppose we take a, a, a random sample from the population of size n star, and then g is actually observed for a subsample of this, uh, which is determined by a latent variable, l, crossing a threshold, c, where l and g have a joint bivariate normal distribution given by um, the expression there, so they're both normal. Um, this is the standard Heckman selection model, and it's easy to see here that again, if you allow the population size to increase holding n, little n fixed, the, the, the correlation does tend to zero as, as population size increases. <clears throat> okay, so I'm gonna talk about an alternative uh, law, and then I'll stop. Um, but first, a digression. David Cox, who taught me at a master's level in, in, at Imperial College, talks about precision and accuracy. An estimate is precise if it has low uncertainty, small standard error, and narrow confidence interval. An estimate is accurate if it's precise and close to the true value, small bias and standard error, or small root mean square error a narrow confidence interval around the true value, so not, not biased. Um, so for example, if a target population is 40.4, 40%, the estimates 50% with a confidence interval 0.1 to 0.9, um, that has low precision and accuracy, but no evidence of bias because the confidence interval covers 0.4 comfortably. On the other hand, if the estimate was 0.5 and the confidence interval was 0.47 to 0.53, a much larger sample. Here we have a very large sample, we have high precision, but we don't have high accuracy because the estimate is biased. Doesn't, it's not included in the confidence interval. And then ideally we wanna have a small confidence interval that covers the true value. So. It has high precision and high accuracy, so no evidence of bias. Um, big data, the problem is it's precise because it's lots of data, but it's potentially inaccurate. Generally speaking, as the sample size increases, precision increases, but bias tends to stay constant. In fact, you could argue it might even actually go up because if, it, if the sample size gets very large, you have less control over the sampling, and so the measurement error might increase. So with small sample sizes, maximizing precision is important, but with large sample sizes, minimizing bias is important. Um, big data, large data sets often not collected for a specific research objective with statistical design, um, implies high precision but selection bias leads to high potential for inaccuracy. Okay, so now I have an alternative law. So here again is uh, Jali's law of large populations. Um, I wanna have a law, so it's not really my law, but I'm gonna call it my law. I'm gonna call it Little's law of large samples since I think it's the sample size that matters, not the population size. Well, it's not a very sexy law. You've probably seen this law before. It says that the mean squared error um, is, uh, is um, which is kind of accuracy squared, if you like, is uh, the finer population correction because we only apply this thing to the cases that, uh, that are not sampled. So we have to multiply it by finite population correction to deal with the fact that we have a sample, a finite population times 
what we already think, already know about mean square error is bias squared plus precision. Selection bias squared plus precision. So that's my law of large samples. There's nothing mysterious about it. It's a, model. it's a law that we already have. But the point I want to emphasize is that there's no row in this formula and the sample size is the thing that matters, not the population size, provided F is not close to one. So, Zhao Meng's examples, I think, are great. I think they've helped to highlight the dangers of small selection bias in large data sets. But I think his law of large populations is misleading because it inappropriately treats the correlation as a form of universal constant. This leads to the false supposition that, that the population size is the important quantity for bias variance trade-offs, but I think it's the sample size that matters. So thank you, that concludes my talk and I'd be happy to answer. Do you think I'm right or any comments? So that's my question. So I guess as the, as the moderator, I will wait for, if anyone has a question they'd like to just ask, they can turn their mic on. Otherwise they can also just enter the chat. Otherwise I can ask a question or two. Hi Rod, this is Brumar. So uh, thanks for the quest, for the thinking. So I was thinking if you could go back to your slide 28, please. Oops. So from... This alternative law, slide 28, yes, this one. So I think he did make this mistake in his 2014 original version when he was looking at the bias expression. But if I recall, the published version of the paper actually talks of, actually acknowledges that, that if you really look at just the row RG and not in the mean squared error scale, then you actually mask this effect of sample size. And, cap and so I think it is in a footnote of the paper where he acknowledges this. And uh, he looks at this expression um, when you actually take squares of this. So then there is an expectation over R of rho RG square. That's the first term. Mm -hmm. And then the second term is one minus F by F and the, and the third term is sigma G square. So that expectation of R rho RG square actually and constrained on the distribution that summation RI equal to N actually does boil down to what you have written, I think. Yeah, I, you know, you're manipulating, there's, a, there's only one expression, there are two different ways of expressing the same thing. Right. right. So, so it's not like, it, it can't be any different. Right? Because the question is, uh, and certainly you can, you can square this thing, take expectation, which I, which I, th I think Jali does in this paper. The point is that it puts the emphasis to my mind in the wrong, that, that, so it's not that not that the formula is wrong. It's just that the what's the what are the key quantities right. um, for for figuring out what's going on for policy, as he says in one of his statements. Right. To my mind, rho is not the, a key quantity, and it's misleading because it says that the the the, the finite that the, the population size matters. That's that's the, the only point I'm making. The relative size of the sample um, in terms of uh, probability versus non-probability samples, I don't disagree with anything you're saying. That, that, that you can get by with a small random sample, or a small random sample can be equivalent to, to a non-probability sample from a much, that's much larger. Mm -hmm. That I think is very good, a very valuable point to make, and he makes it very well. Um, so I like that part. But uh, he's trying to say that, that it's the population size that matters. I think that's wrong. Yeah, so I, uh, my takeaway was slightly different because I, I took away that it, the way of representing this would be if you actually take expectation over R of this rho RG square, and he shows that for any kind of probabilistic sample that is of the order of uh, capital N inverse, right? So. Right. So that's, that was my takeaway that where um, 
the probabilistic sample and non-probabilistic samples differ in this calculation is where you are taking this expectation with respect to R of rho RG square and show the order that actually, that was my, my takeaway from it. But I agree with you that from a conceptual point of view, um, in terms of bias variance, small and obviously matters. But when you want to really characterize sampling, right? So when your focus is on the sampling, mm. I learned um, that result from, the, from his exposition when the expectation over R came in and I could build in different sampling designs and say that the order was of this magnitude if you take expectations so to different designs. Doesn't everybody already know that if you have probability sampling, R is unrelated to the survey variable, so the correlation is essentially zero, zero. I mean, there's nothing new in that. Yeah. Well, we all know that already. Right, but I think the, the, the interesting thing for me was that if actually there is a correlation between the variable that you're studying and your self-selected sampling, uh, then how to characterize that. But, but I, I agree with you. Okay, thank you. So, I'll raise my hand. Um, yeah, thanks, Rod, for for this. I, uh, I, I it always bugged me about his his focus on capital N, and so it's nice to kind of see it it unpacked here a little bit. I mean, he basically was working with the the sort of missing data right formulation that uh, the the bias and the in in missingness is a function of the association between the the outcome and the missingness indicator and the uh, and the um, missingness uh, rate. So, um, so it seems like he sort of applied that in this different context, and you know, you can see that uh, when you focus on on mean square error, and, and I guess I would note also, maybe it wasn't clear to everybody, but that that first expression is actually simply a finite population uh, reconstruction. There's no expectation. There's no sampling going on here. It's literally the difference between the sample mean and the population mean, where those other right. quantities are all written and terms of statistics of, of the population mean, of the population. So, right. um, but, uh, but I think, um, uh, I think you're right. I mean, I think it, it could be a little misleading for folks that aren't really deeply into the, into the sample issue um, because of the fact that in, in any, even when it's not a not, even when it's a quote, non-probability sample, you know, sort of the fixed mechanism that you described in your, in your first example, um, it, as, as, as you vary little n and big n, you're going to mess with rho, and that's going to, you know, sort of counterbalance the, the effect of, of big n. Um, I, I would say one small thing, too, in his, in, a bit in the defense of his paper, though, I think there, uh, he is kind of concerned, I think, about situations where f is large. So administrative data type situations where you may be getting like 80 or 90 percent of the population, but in some fashion, remaining 10 percent might be very different. So, so I think that, uh, you know, that, that sort of aspect of it maybe, you know, can be totally glossed, glossed over, but. But I mean, if, if you look at the other yeah, no, expression, I mean, yours, yours the is, other expression, you know, right. the, 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 the sampling fraction comes into that in a very natural right. way. Right. So then one over. So, so, I mean, another way of, of criticizing generally is to say, well, these are, if you, if you do what, what Rama is saying, so you, you take uh, the square of these things and then take the expectation, you would get this thing, right? The, the same expression, right? So yeah. the question is whether this decomposition is a better decomposition than that decomposition. Exactly. Whether the first decomposition, the law of large populations, is better than the second one. I think it isn't. Yeah. Because the second one focuses on, true, the finite population fraction map select the one minus f matters is f, if f gets close to one. But, but it's really just a decomposition of mean squared error into bias and variance. Yeah. And the variance depends on little n, not on capital N. So, so I think Zhao leaves, it's a re-expression, but it's not a helpful re-expression. It's just emphasizing the wrong quantities. Emphasizing the wrong quantities because rho is not a fixed characteristic. Rho is something that depends on little n, capital N, because r, is a function of the sample size and the population size. The distribution of R depends on the sample. Yes. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. He's trying to reconceptualize the bias in terms of that row, but that is a little problematic, I think, potentially because of the fact that, as you said, it 
depends on little and big n was by itself. Any other questions from other audiences? There you are, I'm even finished by 4.20, how about that? How about seminar speaker finishing early? <laughs> Walter had a question, he said. Uh, yeah, do you I, want was to gonna, I was just waiting to see if anyone else did and then I can, I can ask my question. So my, my qu well, so I, I do agree. I, I was just, I had Shelley's paper open on my other screen at the same time as you were talking. So, so the two things that I just wanted to ask were, so one, I do agree, because if I, with your point about rho being a, a quantity that's quite difficult to, to think about if, if f is not constant in the sense of, so, so I forget what page it is, but he, the way right. he thinks about his asymptotics is, I'm going to let my population grow. I'm going to do a finite sample analysis in the set, or finite population analysis, but let my populations grow. So his asymptotics are always in that case, but I'm going to keep my F fixed. And what you can actually show too, is that this row can be, especially with, with binary data, which is his application, you can rewrite the row in terms of that F. So if you don't, if you're not, if you don't keep F constant, then that row is going to change and nothing's, you know, there's not going to be a lot of sense. That being it's said, just the binomial variance. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and my, 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 only, my only question though was, and I was looking at, um, you know, I, I, so I've been looking at a lot of the COVID data, is if you look at a plot of sample size as a function of population size per state uh, or per country, you do see that the, the, little, the little n does, does vary in some way with capital N. Uh, in terms of overall testing. And so I'm just trying to think about, you know, how, how, do, how should I conceptualize when I'm looking at multiple countries where in some sense, if I thought about F, I mean, I have a plot right here of, uh, well, you can't see it, but I, you'll have to believe me. I, guess. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I believe <laughs> that it's uh, across the US states. If I do a, a plot of the fraction tested um, or the number of tests against the log total so log population against log total tests, it looks pretty much linear in, on the log scale. Um, not saying that that's very helpful, but I'm just trying to understand, it seems to be then the relation, there is a relationship between little n and capital N, which means F is changing as a function of population size. So I shouldn't think of little n as fixed and F going to zero. So, so how, should I, how should I do right. asymptotics in such a setting? Well, the traditional Traditionally, you're told in a survey sampling setting, provided the sample fra sampling fraction is small, so it's not, so you have a much small, you have a smaller sample in the population. You're mm -hmm. restricted to that situation. The uh, the common wisdom in surveys is that you you have a pretty constant sample size regardless of the population size. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if you're doing opinion surveys uh, for elections in different states. Different states have very different population sizes. But I mean, if, if, you're, if you were to take a simple random sample, a, a random sample, which, which polling firms don't do really random sampling anymore. But, uh, but typically you'd expect a sample, a sample size of around 400 mm -hmm. to get the margin of error. And notice the margin of error for probability sampling theory depends on little n, it doesn't depend on capital N at all, mm -hmm. which is sort of what uh, Mike was saying. So, uh, uh, so you know, in 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 practice, it could be that that, that, that f does vary. That size, f does vary a bit with the, the population. So the sample size might increase a bit with uh, with higher larger population rather than smaller population. Maybe that's just a matter of the resources you actually have want to expend on doing the survey. But I mean, the the, the whole idea that we tell people in a, in a in a basic course on sampling is. Uh, that the population size really doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. That it's the sample size that you need is pretty much the same, whether you have a population of a million or a population of a hundred million. So, um, so in that sense, the sample size is pretty much fixed. Mm 
And then, so the question is, if, this, if you buy that sort of idea, which I think is true, I mean, the, the, the binomial variance is determined by little n, it's not determined by essentially um, for, the, for the portion, right? So if you buy that, then uh, why would you say that the population size matters that much? Which is sort of what Xiao Li seems to be saying to me. And uh, so that's what people like Mike and I look at and say, wow, that's strange. Nobody has said that before. Mm -hmm. And then you look at the formula and, and the problem is that this rho is really not a constant thing. Yep. Are there any other questions? May I ask a question? Sure. Um, so, uh, yeah, I like Ross formula. I think it's more fundamental, but I, I think the the message here is trying to. It's not. It's not really my formula, by the way. I, I just. Yeah, the formula you put there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, to me, I think that. Yeah, I also enjoy uh, uh, Shaolin's talk. I didn't read his paper, but to me, I think the 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 you know the thing make me thinking more is that. Yeah, everybody, I think you know cares about the bias in big sample, and uh, but what's more fundamental than the bias, right? You put the bias in the form in in the, in the formula here, but still, it's not fundamental in the sense that how do we really explain that? Uh, I think Xiaoli trying to use the correlation, but I don't think the correlation is that fundamental either because it's related to sample size and population size and many things. To me, you know, if we think about the 2016 election, I think a more fundamental thing is that if you randomly pick a Trump supporter and uh, to ask, right, how much mm -hmm. likely they will tell you the truth and what is your, right. you, you ask a Hillary supporter. So the difference in the probability is something more fundamental on the individual level. Is the bias a function of that quantity by itself? Or well, I, I think the correlation is definitely not. Well, if the, if the respondent is not telling you the truth, that's measurement error. Uh, and and, and Jowley doesn't talk about measurement error at all in his paper. So, so this idea that data quality, to, to define data quality in terms of uh, selection bias is, is, is a little... Uh, Dangerous. I mean, one, one thing I, I agree. I mean, if they don't tell you the truth, that's measurement error. On, on the other hand, you could ask, "Do you like like to be part of my survey?" They could say no. Yeah, it's a different problem. Yeah, that, yeah, that's selection bias. Yeah. Right? Is that a, yeah. is the bias here a direct function of that probability, or of that probability with with sample size or other things? That's my question. Yes, yes, it is. And uh, okay, so let's say that the question is. I mean, really, well, this is what it boils down to. I mean, I, I, my formula has a simpler, the, the F comes into my formula in a simpler way than it does in Charlie's formula. So I, I, I think from a simplicity point of view, the, the sampling fraction, the, 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 the law of large samples conveys the, the role of the sampling fraction better. But anyway, the, 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 the key distinction here is, do you look at rho or do you look at bias? Which is the fundamental quantity? Well, I think bias is the fundamental quantity because what we teach people is that the bias doesn't really depend on the sample size. The bias is relatively stable. So this selection bias is a relatively stable quantity as the sample size goes up, whereas the variance goes down. Right? So that's what we say when we talk about mean square error. Right? The, this, the, the bias becomes the key thing in large samples, whereas the variance becomes the, the predominant thing in small samples. That's what the law of large samples tells you. And I don't think that Zhao Li's law gets us beyond that, because I think if, if I was going to take a, a fundamental quantity, the fundamental quantity is selection bias, it's not rho. He would probably argue with me. After, well, I I'll argue with Jali at some point. I like Jali a lot, so I'm not trying to ding him. So, so, so let me just put in one more, one more point in for Jali's favor. Um, I think if you think about little n and big n is fixed, and thus f is fixed, and essentially in that top, that top law, the only thing you're fiddling with is how your, is how your, uh, and g is fixed. It's just how you're sort of pegging the r's, right? You have a certain number, and so in different sampling mechanisms or different mechanisms for data to appear, or whatever you want to term that, 
um, not probability sampling. Um, then, then R changes. Everything else stays constant. I mean, then rho changes. Everything else stays constant. Mm -hmm. So I guess for n being capital N being fixed, that that error will will then will then vary, right? As you sort of increase that association. Yeah, that's and, I, and I think for the audience that he's looking at, where people are not necessarily samplers, but they have some sense about what this row might mean, I think that that could be important. I think it's misleading. I mean, I think what your, your, your statement is correct, but I think it's giving you the misleading conclusion. The, the misleading conclusion being that the population size matters. Can I, can I add two points? Sure. This is Yajun. Um, oh, for, yeah. the f for the first formula, when I saw it, it's the same as the net response bias formula we have been teaching all the time. Like um, the, the book you edited with Bob Gross, that's the standard net response bias definition, which is a function of the correlation between the response propensity and the outcome variable and the response rates. So that, that's why I feel like it's a standard formula and I, I agree with you that we should not focus on the population size, but rather the correlation and then the response or the selection rate. Then my second point is like a promotion. Um, I think that you and Raghu and Mike put together the working group in Madas looking into the selection bias in COVID-19 studies. And recently, I, I have to push forward by calibrating a non-probability sample, which is not even a sample, it's the hospital test records to get the population level prevalence estimates. And I see Walter's comment that if your population size increase, the number of tests increase. And that's, that's one aspect that we should adjust for the population um, density. What do you think of this project? Like, how can I frame that? Because we still want to push it forward, like using existing data non probability sure, samples to to get the population level prevalence and we try to control Joe. like we we wanted this sample has nothing to do with the test results or the prevalence yeah i and, think it's fine i think it's fine i think what Jali is doing in his example is fine too when he looks at the election study and back calculates <clears throat> to to say that the 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 the, the the yeah, bias sample of 2 million has about the same mean squared error as a random sample of 400 is, is, is fine. Um, now, whether you, the, the interpretation of this row as being very small, I think is more questionable because I don't know how you interpret the row. That's basically my point. Um, but then, so I, so I have no problem with looking at uh, biases with specific populations. Always shall these examples, I think they're quite, Powerful. That's not what I'm arguing about. My argue, my ar arguing about whether the row is really a fundamental quantity. I don't think it is, and uh, and furthermore, I think it's a quantity that leads to a misleading conclusion that the population size matters. It only matters to the extent that the the, the sampling fraction gets close. It is not small. So Rod, can I ask you a question? So if yeah. I actually had uh, the probability of selection, say in a non-probabilistic sample, I'm trying to model it. I'm trying to model it in terms of say certain covariates um, that who gets into my sample, I really don't know it because it's a non-probabilistic sample, but I'm st still trying to model it in terms of say in electronic health record data. Uh, in those cases, um, you know, we the property of the methods really depends on the conditional independence between your selection and the probable quantity of interest or the association of interest and right. what are you measuring. So in that respect, the selection mechanism, if I throw everything into a bias formula, I just get the bias. But if I want to know about dependencies of things influencing the R, in that sense, is this helpful to look at it this way, even though mathematically I understand? That's, what, that's probably what... what um, is it Yajuan the same? The, the, yeah. uh, the, that's the formula for, for non-response. With non-response, the, the 
prob probability of response is not varying. I mean, the portion of respondents is not varying, really. The, uh, whereas Zhao Li is trying to talk about what happens as, the, as you let the population size increase with the, the sample size staying the same. If you keep the selection fraction constant, then who's going to tell you can't tell whether it's little n or capital N that's having an influence on yeah. things mm -hmm. because they're, they're, you know, they're both going the same way. So you have to, you have to untie them to figure something useful out. Um, yeah, so I, maybe Yajuan's right that in the response situation, this, make, this makes more sense. Certainly the propensity is, a, is an important quantity and, and whether the propensity is related to the survey variable is an important thing. Whether I look at the correlation, I'm not so sure. I think there are other, I might look at you know, a plot of, plot of one against the other or something. But you're quite right that the, the, the relationship certainly is, to my mind, I think you're convincing me it's more compelling in the respon on response situation than it is in the sample situation. So actually so, I- But, but I nobody's saying, nobody's sa somehow stating that when you're talking about response bias, non-response bias that the population size matters. Right, right. I mean, that, that, you'll know, you won't find that in any, any, yeah. state, in, in any text about non-response. Right. Particularly like in the COVID-19 problem because the probability of who gets tested uh, depends very much on certain covariates, existing comorbidities, what kind of job sure. do you have? So it's very identifiable, that selection. You can pin it down um, quite, correctly. So that's why I was asking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in Burma, that's, that's exactly the matters working group we are targeting for. So we're trying to decompose this bias conditional on covariates. So you can write this as a summation across cells or strata. Then you have the conditional independence of the testing results and the tensity to death inside the cells. So you would have row J a J is the cell index. So, uh, yeah, Joan, my mind is funded. Grant is on this, so maybe we should talk. I'm leading the matters working group. I think I draw the rag when the mic initiated. Yeah, I'm yeah, doing yeah. the dirty work. So. Um, we yeah, but work. The, the pods grant that I received is exactly on this problem, so we have made some progress as well. We can talk. Yeah, thank you. Just just looking at these two formulas for a minute, which 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 has the better way of looking at sigma? The, I mean, Jolie's formula sigma doesn't depend on n. My, and now my formula uh, says sigma g squared over n, which is what we're, we all we all familiar with. So for, to my you know, mind, it's just a, it's just Jolie's formula is just a very peculiar way of of, of parsing the different terms. Can, can I ask a uh, a stupid question. So the, the two Those statements... Those are the only ones I can answer. So. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, the, the statement quite different. I think if your formula is right, the, the, the first formula is about random variable. So, so the left-hand side, I can understand that g small n is a random variable. So that means the row has to be random variable. Why anybody think that's a constant? Yeah. No, we are not saying that. A yeah, yeah, so, yeah. I mean, the, the interpretation being a constant is kind of a not quite right from the starting point. So that's the point I'm, I think that's the point I'm making. I mean, you could, that's not quite the same because uh, uh, Zhao Li is, the, 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 he's written in terms of G bar little n minus G bar capital N. You could square it to your expectation, now, which is what I think he does in a, in a footnote. Um, and then it would be more, they, they'd be more similar, but I still think that, that the way he's passing these three terms is not, is, is not helpful. I completely agree. Yeah. I, I think, Rod, you should read this up, not just to clarify Solomon's law of large numbers, also for Cache's um, the design effect. I, I get your point that we should also account for bias or use the mean squared error to calculate the design effect, not that still the variance. So you can add another bullet point to, to, to connect it to the design effect we always refer to in the survey research. Yes. Um, right, so, so you could probably modify sigma g squared over n 
by multiplying by a design effect or something to, to allow for a complex design. Um, actually, I think the more important um, way of extending this law of large samples is to include the idea of measurement error. Which is which? Which Jalid acknowledges he doesn't talk about in his paper, so he's not he's certainly quite straightforward about it. He just says he's not talking about measurement there. But for big data, the bias term will be the dominating term, right? Exactly. Provided f is not close to one. I should really put Little's law of large samples. I should put Little in quotes here since I don't really put, I'm not really taking <laughs> any credit for this law <laughs> of large samples. It would be very cheeky of me to do that. No more questions, I guess we can I will not say end the conversation, just pause. Okay, thanks. Thanks everybody for listening. So it's thanks. been fun actually just writing the slides, so it helps to clarify your own thinking. So it's very helpful. Thank you, Rod. Sure. Thanks. Thank you.